Waking to the cold wind whistling through the cabin, the last thing you remember is fear and a deafening roar of metal bending. A wave of pain engulfs your body. Looking to one side, you see the cabin of the plane, while the other side, there's snow falling. You feel damp, ice cold, and then pins piercing your skin, which isn't helping the pain. Did we crash, you think? Shouts come from the distance. Through the heavy falling snow, you can make out shadows. You think it's people. They are calling for survivors. The water is slowly rising. You have to fight, at least try. You unbuckle the belt holding you to the seat. You plunge into the icy water. It takes your breath, but you fight through it and head for the shadowy figures. This was Air Florida Flight 90 and this is the good, the bad and the pure evil. Air Florida Flight 90 was a domestic passenger flight in the US going from Washington National Airport to Fort Lauderdale with a stopover at Tampa International Airport. January 13th, 1982, a Boeing 737-222 registered as N62AF crashed into the 14th Street Bridge that sits over the Potomac River. Hitting the bridge, which was Interstate 395, connecting Washington, D.C. to Arlington County, Virginia. Several cars would be hit from the crash and nearly 100 feet of the guardrail would be taken out. After this, the plane plunged into the ice of the Potomac River. 74 passengers and five crew were on board. Only four passengers and one crew member were rescued alive. Another passenger did live long enough to help with the rescue, but sadly drowned before he could be rescued. Four motors would die when the bridge was hit. Civilians and professionals would try their best to rescue survivors. Days later, at a State of Union speech, President Reagan would praise these efforts. Eventually, the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, would state the cause of the accident as pilot error. The pilots were found to have failed to switch on the engine's internal ice protection system. That they used the reverse thrust in the snowstorm before takeoff. They tried to use the jet exhaust to melt the ice in front of them and failed to abandon takeoff when a problem of power was seen while taxiing along with this having ice and snow on their wings. Looking at the cockpit crew, you had pilot captain Larry Wheaton. At the crash time, he had 8,300 hours of flight and nearly 2,400 hours commercial jet experience, all logged at Air Florida. He had over 1,700 hours with the type of Boeing involved in the accident and over 1,100 of these hours was a captain. Wheaton was said to be good, knowledgeable, operated well under pressure, and his leadership was on par with others. May 8, 1980, a bit of an issue would happen. Larry was suspended for failing Boeing 737 company line check. He failed in the areas of adherence to regulation, checklist usage, flight procedures like departing and cruise control. Also, his approaches and landings were questionable. August 27, 1980, he was back on duty, once he had passed the retest. But April 24, 1981, he was back in the hot seat with a bad grade and a company recurrent proficiency check. It showed issues with me memory items, knowledge of the system, and what the aircraft could handle. Just three days later, he would pass the recheck. First officer would be Roger Pettet. He was hired by Air Florida in 1980. By the time of the accident, he had nearly 3,400 flight hours, with 992 of them with Air Florida, all on the Boeing 737. October 1977 to October 1980, he was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. He would rack up over 670 hours here as a flight examiner instructor and ground instructor on F-15 fighter unit. Roger was set, said to be witty, bright, outgoing with excellent command, physical and mental skills of an aircraft piloting. 
dosed the flu with him, said he was cool and calm under pressure, and knew the limitations of the aircraft. He was said to be the type of pilot who spoke up if he knew something was wrong with flight operations. So while, my, while piloting, you have alternating primary pilot roles between pilot in command, or PIC, which is the captain, and second in command, or SIC, which is the first officer. In commercial air operations, it's common for pilots to swap roles each leg. <clears throat> One pilot would pilot fly, PF, and the other not pilot flying, PNF. Overall, the PIC has the last say on all aircraft operations and safety. At the time of the crash, it was First Officer Petit that was the PF. Wednesday, January 13, 1982, a heavy snowstorm was happening. Washington National Airport was closed. As it neared noon, the airport reopened as the heavy falling snow was now light. The scheduled departures were delayed by two hours because of the closure and this would cause a backlog. As the plane was being prepared, snow continued to fall with temperatures as low as minus 4 degrees Celsius. The Boeing was de-iced with heated water and monopropylene glycol. This was done by American Airlines with a ground service agreement with Air Florida. The agreement covered pit-tot tubes, static ports along with engine inlets had to be used by American Airlines employees but they didn't follow these procedures. The de-icing was done with one vehicle and two operators. Two different people made two different mixtures, so the de-icing on the right side was different to that on the left. The inaccurate mixture was done to the, was down to the nozzle being replaced. The operators weren't to blame on this, as there was supposed to be a mixed monitor on the nozzles to let them know there was an issue, but there wasn't on the new nozzle. Leaving the gate, the plane had issues. The ground service tow motor couldn't get traction due to the ice. For about 90 seconds, the crew tried reverse by using the reverse thrust of the engines, which did, which did nothing. I was also against Boeing operations of ice. Finally, a tug ground with snow change pushed the plane back from the gates. After this, it took another hour in a taxi line due to the backlog to get to the runway. Sitting so long, the plane should have returned to the gate to be de-iced again, but it wasn't done. It's thought this was because to avoid more delays. Snow and ice would recover the wings. The pilots were aware, but chose to take off anyway. Taking off, the snow was back falling heavy. Temperatures were once again freezing. And at this point, the crew should have activated the engine anti-ice system. But in the checklist, you can hear the captain confirm it was off. This system was to use heat from the engines to stop sensors freezing, and then readings would be accurate. Conditions were bad, cold, icy. With the engine's anti-ice system not engaged, it caused an engine pressure ratio, or EPR, this would have trust indicators throw false readings. Engine power temp and airport altitude of Washington National should be 2.04 EPR. But on this plane, from the cockpit recorder, it was stated as 1.70. Both pilots didn't have much experience in this weather. The captain made eight takeoffs or landings in snowy conditions in the 737 while the first officer only did two. So while taxiing, the pilots decided to stick close behind a DC-9. They thought the heat from the DC-9 engine would melt the snow and ice off the Flight 90's wings. This was against flight manual recommendations. Now the exhaust gas from the DC-90 did melt the snow, but during takeoff, instead of the snow falling off, it went to slush and froze. At takeoff, the first officer repeatedly pointed out instrument reading issues, in particular that the plane felt low on power taking off, but was recording as fine. The pilot ignored this concern and gave the go ahead to take off. Investigators said that although the captain missed this, he still had plenty of time and space to abandon takeoff. 
the pilot was criticised, ignoring the first officer, who was correct in his concerns. The pilot was advised strongly not to delay as another aircraft was 2.5 miles out in its final approach to the same runway. The plane would be airborne, but only briefly. The voice recorder would sound out the stick shaker, a device that warns the crew the plane is in danger of stalling. The aircraft would take off half a mile more than usual on the runway. Survivors would say the trip on the air and the runway was extremely rough, and even when they became airborne, they felt the need to assume the crash position. Those who survived said others did this as well. The 737 climbed to 352 feet, and then started to lose altitude. Recorders recovered would show that the 737 was only in the air 30 seconds. At 4.01 p.m., the 737 crashed into the 14th bridge across the Potomac River. Six cars and a truck would be hit in the bridge. The bridge's rail and wall were all destroyed by the impact. Flight 90 then plunged into the icy Potomac River. Four crew members, including both pilots, died. One crew member was very badly injured. 70 passengers died. 19 were believed to have survived, but injuries stopped them escaping. Four out of these would survive and live. On the bridge, four had been fatally injured, one had serious injuries, and three would minor. Clinging to the tail section of the broken plane was flight attendant Kelly Duncan and four passengers, Patricia Felsch, Lee Stiley, Arland Williams and Priscilla Torado. Arland was strapped and tangled in a seat. Kelly would find an inflated float and was able to get it to Patricia who was severely injured. Passenger Bert Hamilton was in the water. He was the first to be pulled to rescue. With the bad weather, many offices closed early for safety. Because of this, a huge backup of traffic all over the city happened, making it very difficult for emergency services to get to the crash. The Coast Guard was nearby. The name of the harbour tugboat was the Capstan. They were to break up ice and respond to water rescue. At the time of the crash, the Capstan was downriver on a different search and rescue mission. Ground emergency services would take 20 minutes to get on scene with the ice and traffic. Emergency services would have to mount the sidewalks to get around the block. When they did arrive on scene, they couldn't help those in the water as they didn't have the correct equipment. Even swimming out to the survivors was impossible with freezing waters and thick heavy ice. Makeshift lifelines were made out of belts and thrown out to the survivors, but this did nothing. The media would report on the rescue attempts. They reported of rescuers, both professional and civilian, going into the water to try and get the survivors. They could only enter the water minutes at a time and would come out covered in ice. People would tell survivors to hold on and not to give up hope. Pieces of the plane lay on the shore, smouldering, and screams came from the survivors. The ice was broken so you couldn't even walk out to the survivors. Only the tail section of this large plane was visible. The smell of jet fuel was everywhere. Roger Olinan, who worked as a sheet metal foreman, was in his truck on the bridge when he heard a man shouting that an aircraft was in the water. He would be the first to enter the water to try help survivors. Several military guys from the Pentagon would also go to the water's edge to help Roger. These guys were Steve Rains, Aldo De La Cruz and Steve Bell. At this point, flight controllers knew the plane disappeared from radar and they weren't responding to radio calls, but they didn't know yet what happened or where the plane was. About 4.20 p.m., U.S. Park Police Long Ranger helicopter arrived at the crash site with pilot Donald Usher and paramedic Melvin Windsor. They began to try airlift survivors to the shore. This was a huge risk themselves as they were close 
to the water's surface. It was reportedly so close the helicopter skids dipped into the water. The helicopter dropped a line to the survivors and tucked them to shore. Bert Hamilton was the first. He was treading water about 10 feet from the plane's tail. When Bert reached the shore, some fire and rescue personnel had arrived and pulled him from the water's edge. The helicopter went back out this time. Arland Williams got the line. Arland would also be called the sixth passenger. Arland was unable to free himself from the wreck, so he passed the line to crew attendant Kelly Duncan, and she was towed to the shore. Going out a third time, the helicopter dropped two lifelines as fears began that those remaining might become hypothermic. Ireland was still stuck as he passed the line to Joe Seeley. He held Patricia Tarado, who was blinded by jet fuel. Her husband and baby sadly died in the crash. Joe's co-worker, Nikki Felch, took the second line. All three were pulled through the water. Priscilla and Nikki would lose their grip and fell back into the water. Priscilla was so weak and couldn't grab the line when the helicopter came back. A bystander named Lenny Skidnick jumped into the water and pulled Priscilla to the shore. The helicopter then focused on Nikki. Paramedic Windsor went onto the skid and grabbed Nikki by her clothes, lifting her up onto the skid and taking her back to the shore. The helicopter went back out for Ireland but where he was stuck was now rolled, submerging him underwater. Arlen sadly died, the only passenger to die this way. His body, along with the others, were recovered later. The 737 broke into several large pieces. Although impact speeds were low and within survival limits, how it broke up and the exposure to the freezing water proved fatal to all except those in the tail section. The NTSB would state the accident as it's not survivable. The NTSB stated the probable cause included the flight crew's failure to ensure a sterile cockpit during final pre-check. NTSB would further state, contributing to the accident were the prolonged ground delays between de-icing and the receipt of ATC takeoff clearance, during which the aircraft was exposed to continual precipitation, the unknown inherent pitch of characteristics of the B737 aircraft when the leading edge is contaminated with even small amounts of snow or ice, and the limited experience of flight crew in jet transport winter operations. To honour the sixth passenger, Ireland William, giving up his life to save others, the repaired section of the 14 bridge was named Arnold D. William Jr. Memorial Bridge. In his hometown in 2003, an elementary school was named after Arlen. Roger O'Lennon and Lenny Skidnick both received the Coast Guard Gold Life Saving Medal. Arlen would also receive this. Lenny also was introduced to the joint session of the US Congress during President Reagan's State of Union speech. The two crewmen of the helicopter were awarded a silver life-saving medal. They also received the Interior Department's Value Award. Kelly Duncan, the flight attendant, would be recognised for her unselfish act giving the only life vest to a passenger. The investigations led to a number of changes in the pilot training regulations. Some blame was put on the lack of experience of the flight crew. Air Florida was known to hire young, as they would cost less. The incident became widely used as a case study for aircraft crews and rescue crews. From the accident, Air Florida lowered its service and cut employees to cope with the decrease in finances. Just two and a half years after the crash, it filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's been argued whether the crash caused the failure of Air Florida, but senior analysis Thomas Coynan stated, I don't believe one crash can make or break an airline. There were a lot of factors involved in Air Florida's bankruptcy. Thank you all for listening. Next time I'll be looking at Eric Edgar Cook, also known as the Nightcaller and the Nedlands Monster. 
He was an Australian serial killer who haunted Perth from 1958 to 1963, eventually charged with 22 violent crimes, eight of which ended in death. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.